morning, Your Honors. My name is Ian Stumpf, and I represent appellants Pamela Ball and Charles Smalley. This is an appeal of a class action lawsuit that was improperly dismissed under the Res Judicata Doctrine. This lawsuit sought to remedy homeowners for illegally charged fees that were unearned throughout foreclosures conducted by Shapiro and Burson through their use of a practice widely known as robo-signing. This case was dismissed under the doctrine of Res Judicata. The Res Judicata Doctrine, as you well know, must, in order for a party to invoke that doctrine, a party must establish three elements, that the parties are the same or in privity with the parties in the earlier dispute, or the second prong, which I'm going to focus on here today, that the claim presented is identical to the one determined in the prior adjudication. That's from the Laurel, Sand, and Gravel Incorporated v. Wilson case that was before this court about five years ago. Focusing here on the second prong, appellant's present claims, the claims that were brought in the lawsuit, could not have been raised in the prior foreclosure actions. Claim preclusion only precludes claims that could have been asserted and litigated in the original suits. And one of the reasons that Judge Mott dismissed the case, he cited the Singer v. Stephen Cox Incorporated case, where the, quote, means of obtaining such knowledge of a claim existed and the knowledge could have been obtained with ordinary diligence, then the claim would be precluded. In this case, Your Honor, the information that was presented was only obtained after these homeowners had their homes foreclosed on. The information that was brought to light by the affidavit of Mr. Jose Portillo, a whistleblower who used to work... The alleged misconduct, did you say? That's correct, Your Honor. Occurred before the time that the auditor filed the report? That's correct, Your Honor. Didn't the Maryland cases that you cited deal with, by and large, conduct that occurred after the filing of the auditor's report? I'm not sure I understand what you mean, Your Honor, but there are... I do have case law that supports the proposition that claims, like this is cases for, in terms of the Rooker-Feldman Doctrine, it does not bar a federal court challenge to an individual's improper conduct during a prior state court proceeding. So there is legal precedent for bringing forth claims after that alleged this type of thing. The strong presumption is that you should raise your objection at the time of the auditor's report, is it not? That's correct, Your Honor, but in this case, how could someone who had their homes foreclosed raise an objection based on information that at that point just would have been wholly speculative? This information hadn't come to light, and if these homeowners had raised an objection to the auditor's report based on the business practices of... I mean, there's a due diligence requirement. You're not just to sit passively by. Yes, but due diligence in this part, in this case, would have required sending almost spies into this business to take a look at their business practices. The business practice couldn't have come to light, and frankly, a good business might keep their trade practices secret to an extent. This wasn't brought to light until one of the people inside that company decided to come forward and blow the whistle on their practices. I mean, ordinary due diligence in this case could have meant that the homeowners giving Shapiro and Burson a call and saying, well, do you have good practices? And of course, they would have said yes. This information was bottled away in the individual employees... There was some deference to the way in which the trial court analyzed the due diligence question. I'm sorry, Your Honor, I didn't hear all that. We owe some deference to the way in which the trial court found there was an absence of due diligence sufficient to invoke the exception. I don't quite understand. Could you maybe ask that in a different way? No, I won't. Okay. I don't understand. Well, in this case, the test of obtaining the knowledge with ordinary diligence. The Singer v. Stephen Koch's case 
says ordinary diligence. And I have another case, the O'Hara v. Covins case, which says that whether a party acts with proper diligence is a fact question for the jury. I have a cite for that. That's 305 MD 280. So this, even if there is the matter of diligence, that was a fact question for the jury. And it was improper for the district court to dismiss the case without allowing the appellants an opportunity to develop an evidentiary record of the due diligence. Mr. Stump. Yes. I trust you won't view this as a curveball. It's certainly not intended as a curveball. But can you address Rooker-Feldman? Sure. Why isn't this case squarely barred by Rooker-Feldman? I understand the district court didn't reach that issue, but it was clearly presented below. And as you well know, this court can decide a case on any ground, affirm a district court on any ground appearing in the record. Okay. Why isn't this a classic Rooker-Feldman problem? Sure. Well, the Sixth Circuit in Pittman stated that Rooker-Feldman does not bar a federal court challenge to an individual's improper conduct during a state court proceeding. I brought this up earlier in my question. But here we have improper conduct that is shielded by a final judgment. That's correct. Okay. But as to the second prong of res judicata. I'm not talking about res judicata. We're talking about Rooker-Feldman. Okay. Well, here the appellants challenged the improper conduct of the appellees in the prior foreclosure actions. This particular claim wasn't brought up in the prior actions. The prior actions dealt with it was just a simple foreclosure. This deals with the business practices of Shapiro and Burson that led to the foreclosure. The auditor's report has been ratified, and that amounts, you agree that that amounts to a final judgment? That's by a state court? Yes. So how can you upset that without transgressing classic Rooker-Feldman doctrine? Well, my reading of Rooker-Feldman, Your Honor, is that it wouldn't bar a federal court challenge to improper conduct during the state court proceeding. And at this point, and this case. But that conduct is the subject of a final state court judgment. That's correct. And we can't review a final state court judgment. Only the Supreme Court can do that. Okay. Well, I. But your exception is one that bars the rule. I mean, that swallows the rule. Anytime you think you can just come into court at any time after a final state court judgment and say there's prior misconduct. And that would allow collateral attacks upon state court judgments ad infinitum. And doesn't Maryland have some interest in the finality of its foreclosure proceedings that a federal court can't undermine collaterally? I mean, part of the fabric of Maryland law, as I understood it, and as a district judge might seem to understand it, is that they didn't want these proceedings to dribble on indefinitely. And this whole idea of just attacking final state court judgments by collateral or civil judgments by filing suits in the first instance in federal court is, I think it's bad business. Absolutely, Your Honor. But I do have four cases which I'd like to draw the court's attention to. Two from the Sixth Circuit and another from the Ninth Circuit. In the Todd v. Weltman case, 434F.3D432, and these are all in the record somewhere, it held that Rooker-Feldman did not bar a plaintiff's FDCPA claim that defendant obtained after a favorable state court judgment, which was obtained through a fraudulent affidavit, much like the case that was before us today. In the Brown v. First Nationwide Mortgage Corporation, another Sixth Circuit case in 
FAPX-APPX-436, held that Rooker-Feldman did not bar plaintiff's claim based on foreclosure obtained through defendant's fraud. But you don't challenge the foreclosure here, correct? Yes. The foreclosures all were going to take place one way or another. Right. You do not challenge in any way, shape, or form the foreclosure. That's correct. Your claim is rooted solely in the fees and commissions that were paid out of the proceeds of the sale, and those fees and commissions were ratified by a final judgment of a state court. That's also correct. Okay. So how do those cases help you? Well, I'm having difficulty understanding how those cases help you. Well, they show how the Rooker-Feldman doctrine does not apply to this, had not applied to similar circumstances, and how this particular set of circumstances does fit into a similar mold as those cases did. You mean because they're foreclosure cases? Well, they were. Is that the generality that you're offering us? They were both, they were all foreclosure cases, but they were also foreclosures that were obtained through one way or another, through fraud. But you're not challenging that the foreclosure was obtained by fraud, correct? Well, you're not challenging the foreclosure at all in this case. That's correct. I'm challenging that the fees were fraudulently obtained through their business practices. I just don't see any limiting principle to what you are, I don't know how we would ever apply this in the future. I don't see any limiting principle. It can just, because what you allege can be alleged to go behind almost any final judgment of a state court. Okay. Well, it opens up the gates just real wide. Okay. Well, in this point, the limiting principle would be that after all these matters were concluded on a class-wide basis, folks were assessed fees that were unearned as a result. That's not a limiting principle. I mean, it's a statement of the facts of the case, but it's not a limiting principle. And the point that my colleague is making is one that I share, which is that there has to be, that a final judgment has to operate as some kind of a cutoff point. And there has to be some meaning to it that you just can't lightly go behind. Otherwise, judgments just lose their effect if they can be this loosely unwound. Okay. But anyway, thank you. I'm out of time. You're welcome. Mr. Scott. Good morning. May it please the Court, Robert Scott on behalf of Appalese. Your Honors, respectfully, I submit that this is not a close case. Judge Motz got this absolutely right. The plaintiff's claims are barred because they were raised or could have been raised in the state court foreclosure action. If you look at the complaint, I think counsel just conceded that what this is about is the attorney's fees and commissions that were assessed in the foreclosure case. And as the district court noted, the Maryland rules provided a mechanism for the plaintiffs to challenge those fees in the foreclosure case. Maryland Rule 2-543E requires that within 10 days of an audit report, anyone wanting to challenge it file exceptions. And the Maryland Court of Appeals has said more than once that you must raise a challenge to the fees by way of exceptions to the auditor's report or you're barred by res judicata from later raising it. What sort of remedy if the grounds for the challenge is raised after the 10 days? What sort of remedy does the plaintiff have? Well, I believe the only ground there would be in that scenario would be some sort of fraud. And the Maryland rules provide under Rule 2-535 
that you can apply to reopen a judgment if you discover that it was procured by fraud so if they had a if they are claiming that there was fraud and that is the basis for and they do and they do their remedy would be to file a motion to reopen the judgment the state court judgment under the state court rule state equivalent of a federal rule 60 B correct that and and most states have some opening like that I mean the the remedy would be either appeal within the state court system in some way or there'd be a 60 B Maryland's equivalent of a 60 B motion of relief from judgment and the states themselves have remedial schemes what you're saying is the very worst worst way to go about it is to file a collateral federal law right and that's absolutely right your honor the there's there is a procedure under Maryland rules to to reopen a judgment if you believe that it was procured by fraud what about a collateral state court complaint for fraud either within the 10-day period for exceptions or accompanied by the Maryland equivalent of a rule 60 motion in other words I think you understand the question I mean they could have brought a because Maryland is not a compulsory counterclaim state that's so that's all sort of mixed in here and of course the district court had no occasion to address that but but at least theoretically they could have filed a separate lawsuit they and included in that lawsuit something in the nature of exceptions to the auditors report yeah it's well established under Maryland law that you can bring a counterclaim in a foreclosure case so you know if they if they discovered this and they they wanted to bring a claim they either ask the court to reopen the judgment under the under 2 5 35 on the grounds of fraud or file exceptions to the auditors report and allege fraud and but bring a counterclaim in the foreclosure case while that before final judgment is entered and they didn't do any of those three things instead they brought a new suit in federal court and as I think the court understands what they're really doing is trying to attack a state court judgment that found that these attorneys fees were appropriate of course they probably couldn't have brought a class action as a counterclaim in a foreclosure I'm not sure that's that's absolutely right your honor I think they in fact I've seen lawyers try to do that well have you seen any succeed I don't I don't know I have not seen it succeed yet your honor but it I do know from personal experience that it is still being attempted well lawyers do all kinds of yes but again and that here's the other point your honor is that mrs. ball did challenge the attorneys fees in the foreclosure case she appeared and she filed papers which she labeled as exceptions to the auditors report which included a complaint about the attorneys fees and that was raised and what happened to that it was rejected by the the state court that was their final order rejecting that or yeah ultimately there was there was a premature appeal is it in the record yes okay yeah the the that one of those special appeals opinions correct Robert that correct your honor yes so I mean the the argument that they couldn't have raised this is simply incorrect and it's contradicted by their own actions I mean they did challenge it so I don't really understand the argument they challenged it with something in the nature of an exception not an affirmative claim correct or for compensatory and punitive damage that's correct mrs. mrs. ball made a filed exceptions to the auditors pro se I believe so yes and and those were rejected now that the con this argument about lack of knowledge I want to address that briefly as judge Mott's correctly pointed out lack of knowledge does not make race judicata and applicable they and they don't they try to invoke this exception under the the singer case but they don't what they don't recognize is there's nothing in their complaint alleging that they engaged in any due diligence there's nothing in the complaint alleging that they could not have discovered this prior to the the final judgments being entered and they didn't ask to amend and they did not ask to amend and they they argue in their briefs that well we couldn't have discovered this because we didn't know about it but that's not in the complaint and if you're going to rely on your come we're out we're on a motion to dismiss here if it's not in the complaint it's really not shouldn't be considered 
furthermore there they don't explain what facts they would have needed to discover in order to bring these claims they say well we didn't know about the robo signing until after final judgments were entered but the fact is they don't allege any specifics with respect to how the alleged robo signing impacted their particular foreclosures they don't allege that there was any document that was quote unquote robo signed filed in either one of their cases they talk generally about robo signing but they don't say this specific document or affidavit that was filed in my foreclosure case was was robo signed or signed by somebody without authorization so there really isn't anything for that they could have discovered later that would have given them any grounds for a claim and as we articulate later in our brief they don't articulate articulate a viable claim even if you assume everything they say is true it's not a claim for fraud conspiracy or any of the other alleged uh, torts that they've brought so there really isn't any explanation not only of what they would have done or what they could have done or what they did to find this out they don't explain what it is they needed to know before they could have brought the claim. Um, they're relying exclusively on generalized allegations. There's no specifics as to how this uh, alleged robo-signing affected either one of their foreclosures. Um, with respect to the argument that the claims are not identical, um, and I think the court's already covered this, but I'll just point out that they don't discuss the, uh, the Jones case of, that this court decided recently, which is very similar to this, in which uh, plaintiffs were making very similar allegations about uh, defective affidavits filed in foreclosure cases. And this court held unequivocally that those claims were the same claims that were raised or could have been raised in the foreclosure case, and held that the district court in that case did not abuse its discretion by not permitting the plaintiffs to amend their complaint That's to bring these new claims. Opinion, is it? I'm sorry? The Jones case is not a published opinion, is it? it, it that's correct, Your Honor. It was not selected for publication. Um, but it is directly on point, I believe. Um, so I think that's pretty much it. Um, unless the court has any questions, I'll uh, yield the remaining of my time. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, William Carter. Uh, I represent uh, one of the individual defendants in the case, Mr. Jason Murphy. Uh, I wanted to speak to the court uh, just briefly uh, to address Your Honor's question with regard to Rooker Feldman. Uh, we believe that Rooker Feldman, although the, the trial court did not base his decision upon that, it was uh, raised in the briefs and it was discussed and was a basis for the motion to dismiss. And as your, as your Honor described it, we believe that uh, the Rooker-Feldman Doctrine dictates that this case should, not, uh, should, should have been dismissed based upon the application of Rooker-Feldman. Is there anything to add to what my colleague has already said? Uh, I think he did a very good uh, summary, uh, Your Honor. Uh, I would just uh, say that this court's uh, uh, decision in the Devani case uh, speaks volumes with regard to how the court needs to look at this type of a situation, uh, and in this particular case, it's clear you had final judgments. Uh, they're really attacking final judgments here, and that's basically what this court said in Devani, uh, and we would uh, basically say that this court needs to, to continue to follow that line. Uh, the issue of whether things are inextricably uh, bound up in a judgment or not, uh, we believe in a case like this doesn't really even apply. Uh, as this court said in Devani, that inextricably uh, uh, brought into a case is not really a, a test, it's really a conclusion. And we believe that that conclusion uh, fits exactly into this uh, case uh, that's before the court today. If there are no further questions, Your Honor, thank you very much. A few brief points. Um, first of all, uh, there was an argument about that the complaint or the First Amendment complaint um, did not show that the uh, events came to light in a, in a timely manner. But 
Uh, simply the. A little bit. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Sure. That um, the First Amendment complaint did not uh, show that the allegations of Mr. Uh, Portillo came came to light in a uh, in a timely matter. But the what the first complaint does show is is the timeline. Is that Mr. Uh, Mr. Smalley and Ms. Ball uh, had their cases work their way through the courts and were foreclosed upon. Then after those happened, uh, Mr. Por Portillo came forward with his. Uh, with his allegations about the business practices of Shapiro and Burson. Um, second, the allegations about the, that there was no um, mention of, of robo-signing in the First Amendment complaint also is a little off the mark. Um, Mr. Portillo uh, does state in his affidavit, and we allege in the complaint, that he signed uh, several of the documents associated with Ms. Ball, and he also provided a sworn testimony in his affidavit about the business practices of Shapiro and Burson and how those practices were, were applied in the Smalley matter and throughout uh, all the foreclosures that were the basis of this lawsuit. And if, if the court has any further questions for me, otherwise I will I simply submit. Thank you. We thank you very much. We'll come Thank down you. And move directly into our next case.